Okay, uh, I guess we'll start in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 24. Jeremiah 9, 24. We talked last week about boasting and Paul's uh, problem that he had uh, when he comes through the book of Romans. He's dealt with the Gentiles in chapter 1 and then chapter 2. He starts to deal with the, what I consider to be the religious Jew. And uh, he, it's an interesting thing because when you look at what we, we discussed last time, two weeks ago, uh, we, we came to some conclusions about the Jews and, and their boasting in their own religion and boasting in their own works, uh, boasting in their own identity, boasting in everything. Uh, we found out that they were resting in the law. That's what they were doing. And uh, the law isn't designed for you to rest in it. It's designed for you to either keep it or understand your need of a savior and a redeemer. Redemption is, is not possible by yourself. Redemption is not something people can do. You hear that all the time where people will use this phrase, he's going to try to redeem himself. See, when you buy something from somebody, there's always two people involved. You don't buy things from yourself and you don't sell things to yourself. Okay, so when redemption is mentioned, it's, it's kind of a conclusion that there's going to be a purchase. Okay, so w when you redeem someone, as God redeems us, there is a process and a law of redemption. And we're not going to get into that. You can read the book of Ruth and the whole law of redemption is laid out there for you. But the book of Ruth will teach you the details of what it means to be bought out of the marketplace of sin and then taken and put into God's family. That's what redemption is really all about. It's, it's a ransom is what it is. And, and somebody, it, it, when you, they require ransom for you and Satan has you and he wants the ransom. Well, God pays the ransom. And the only way you're going to get out is to have that ransom paid. But you can't pay it. You cannot redeem yourself. So when you look at what, Ro what, what, what Paul's talking about in Romans chapter 2, these guys were resting in the law. They were instructed out of the law in 2.18 they had the truth of the law. They had the truth in the law, Paul says. And in verse 20, 220. And in 2.23, they boasted in the law. And then in verse 23, they were breakers of the law. And you see the word transgression in verse 27. And then in verse 28 and 29, they sought praise of men by the law outwardly. So all of those things are happening right there in chapter 2. And the conclusion was here last time was that the Jews missed the spiritual lesson of the law. Uh, he says, and, and Jason was talking about this this morning, it was great. The, the idea is, he says, search the scriptures for in them ye think ye have eternal life. Do you know how many people are searching the scriptures today because in them they think there's eternal life? Well, what happens when they start the searching? They're misled about where to go look for it. And as a result, they got a Bible, but they don't know how to use it. That's this frustrating thing. It's very frustrating. It's frustrating for them, but it's also frustrating for us. Because as Christendom has proven over and over and over, all this frustration is really their doing. It isn't us, it's them. And I say that meaning churchianity. This whole idea of getting people to study their Bibles is a great new novel thing. Even the Roman Catholic Church is starting to teach Bible studies now. But the problem is, is it, not whether they're studying the Bible. The issue of them studying the Bible is kind of novel. But, but for the real issue with it is, are you studying it rightly divided? So when we go through these things, I want you to remember that there's a context all the time whenever you're reading and studying. And you have to remember that when Paul quotes something, he doesn't always do it the same way. Sometimes he quotes it partially. Sometimes he quotes it uh, when it's actually referring to something concerning Israel. But he assumes that you know now that you're not Israel and that the, the law in principle that he's quoting to you or the verse that he's quoting is now being applied to you in this particular dispensation of grace. Now that's very possible to, to be done because Paul does it all the time. So go back to Jeremiah chapter 9 and let's see if you can take a look at this verse and see if this for you doesn't kind of sum up what we've been talking about in Romans chapter 2 with this religious self-righteous nation who should have known better. 
I mean, they really should have. Of all people on the planet, the Jews had all the advantages. And chapter 3, as we begin, begins with that question. What advantage doth hath, hath the Jew? What's, it, what's the advantage of being a Jew? What is the advantage? I mean, it doesn't look like there's any advantage to it when you read chapter 2. But when you start getting into chapter 3, you're going to find out that they did have every advantage. They just would not take that advantage and use it to the benefit of their ministry and for God. So Jeremiah chapter 9, here's what he says. Look at verse 24. Jeremiah 9, 24. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me that I am the Lord, which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will punish all them which are circumcised with the uncircumcised. So not only the circumcised are going to get punished, his own people, but I'm going to punish the uncircumcision as well. He says, Egypt and Judah and Edom and the children of Ammon and Moab and all that are in the uttermost corners, utmost corners, that dwell in the wilderness, for all these nations are uncircumcised and all the house of Israel are what? Uncircumcised in the heart. You know, there's two verses there. The last one I just read, verse 26. That's a big theme. Uh, doesn't Stephen say something about that in Acts chapter 7? He says to Israel, you're uncircumcised in heart and ears. Your ears aren't spiritual. Your heart isn't spiritual. You, you're not understanding the premise. Romans 2.29 is the same thing. When you, when you go down through this whole thing and you begin to see it, turn back to Romans chapter 2 now, and let's compare this. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 also. Go to Romans chapter 2 and get uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, Romans chapter 2. Paul makes these accusations as, you go, as he goes down through here, and it sounds like a conversation between people today. I mean, if you're going to preach something, if you're going to teach something, if you're going to be, have a religious position about something, should you not? Should you not practice it yourself? Uh, ben Carson asked the question about the, the, this big controversy about the abortion issue with the baby parts they're selling and uh, talking about the chopping these babies up and selling their parts and all that, this big controversy. And he asked the question to those people, to Planned Parenthood. He says, if it's not a baby, why are you trying to harvest parts from it to fix a baby over here? If you're doing research to help babies, if you're doing research to help human beings, how can you say it's not a human being? If you're taking parts from it and going to go over here and fix it. I mean... Do they take other parts to fix you sometimes? How many of you have ever heard of anybody having a heart valve replacement done? You know, they use pig valves to do that. And sometimes they use other animal parts. Because same anim some animal parts are compatible, right? Uh, they, they'll take uh, things and, and your body will not reject and use them. In, in, uh, in the... Uh, military uh, in the days when they were doing surgery on in, in the early days of um, the Iraqi war and over in Afghanistan and these things these people were having to have there were a lot of head wounds and when they have head wounds their their brain swell okay and so they got to take a chunk of the brain out or a chunk of the skull out they cut that skull and they take it out and then they work on the brain they, they drain the fluid off and they get the brain to reduce the swelling. So what do you do with this thing? Well, they cryogenically freeze it. They sterilize it, cryogenically freeze it, wrap it up, mark it, put the guy's name on it, and they put it in there. That's what we do over here. But if you're over there in a battlefield, in a tent, and you've got 14 of these guys you're doing this to simultaneously, what do you do with that part? You know what they did? They slit their abdomen, they stuck it in there, and <laughs> they washed it up, they stuck it in his abdomen and sewed it up. That's where he kept the spare part. 
And when it was time to do that, when it was time to put that thing back in, they just opened him up, took it out, rinsed it off, put it in his brain, and done. That's interesting, right? So if they're going to take pig valves and they're going to do this kind of stuff, so you, you see the logic behind that when he talks about taking these parts out of the aborted uh, child and, and, and then using it in these other research, you understand, isn't that, isn't that kind of getting in their face a little bit about if you believe that, then why don't you do this? Notice what Paul does here. He says, verse 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest not thyself. That thou preachest a man should not steal, do you steal? That thou sayest uh, a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? You ever wonder what the Lord was was writing in the sand when those men came up with that woman in adultery and he says those of you who are without sin let him cast the first stone <laughs> and they all dropped their stones and walked away Mr. O'Hare had a message one time called the handwriting and the sand writing and he's talking about the finger of God writing the Ten Commandments thou shalt not commit adultery he writes it with his finger in granite in stone and then here he is incarnated as a human being and he's writing it in the sand because when they come up to talk to him, he's writing in the sand. What do you think he's writing? Thou shalt not commit adultery. <laughs> you think that's what they walked up and looked at. And they just dropped their stones and walked away. You hear people say that all the time. If you're going to throw, if you're going to, people that live in glass houses shouldn't throw rocks, right? Well, th that's the way it is. That's what he's talking about here. Do you do, you do these things? That's the same thing as chapter 2, verse 1. He's, that's how he started the chapter. Therefore thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest doest the same things. And then he goes on to say in verse 2, But we are sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. Chapter 1, the wrath is coming, you're not getting out. Chapter 2 starts the same way. The wrath's coming, you're not getting out. Chapter 3 is going to say the same thing. The wrath's coming, you're not going to get out. It doesn't matter what you try to do in your pagan religion in chapter 1 or what the Jews try to do in their self-serving ruination of Judaism. It didn't matter. That's not going to get you out. And over here in chapter 3 is you'll find out that the whole world is concluded to be in unbelief and nobody is going to escape the wrath of God. And the wrath of God is a personal thing. It's between you and him. It's not going to be between you and everybody else. It's going to be between you and him. It's a personal thing. He's the only one that can save you. And he's the only one that can take care of you for eternity by way of punishment. You know, Satan can't punish the world for eternity because he's in the lake of fire himself. That's not his job. That's not his business, by the way. You know, and, and so as you begin to look at this, these questions keep coming up. Okay, verse 23, thou that makest thy boast of the law, thou breakest the law, dishonorest thou God. Breaking the law, dishonorest thou God. For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written. What great sin took place in Israel's history that blasphemed God among the Gentiles? All of them, because they were sinning all the time. And the Gentiles are supposed to be looking up to them, and they keep looking down at them. Because they said, what is wrong with these people? And they actually, they actually thought and envied that what Israel had was fantastic. You know why they thought that? Because they saw the power and majesty of God and they believed that that was God doing it. They were just outside the fence. They had no access to him. The great, the great example of that in, the, in your Bible is Rahab the harlot. Because at Kadesh Barnea, over here you see the number four, the Kadesh, the refusal to enter the land. When they sent the spies into the land after the exodus, you know, that was, that was a big failure on their part. Because 
they were afraid to go into that land. They didn't believe God would deliver them. They didn't believe he could take those stupid nine-foot giants, okay? These mutants, okay? He didn't believe, they didn't believe it. Well, after they got judged for that and they go, they enter into this 40-year trek, and here Joshua's a young man when he starts it, and when he gets done with it, he's an older man. They send spies into the land again. And you know what happens? It's interesting. There, there's, there's opportunity now because they're going in. When they go around the, 40, the track for 40 years and then they're going to go over there into the land, it's Joshua's going to take them in. There's, this time is not going to... All the, all the corrupt ones, all the ones who didn't believe coming out of Egypt, all those who were rene, they're renegades and rebels, they're all dead. They all dropped dead on the track. Uh, Todd was saying a while ago the, the floor, the gym floor down at the high school got flooded and they ruined the whole flo floor at the St. Pete High so uh, you know they can't use the gym so they've got to rebuild the gym floor so he said what are they going to do? They're going to be outside walking the track <laughs> what are they going to do for 60 minutes with these classes every day? You know, school's just getting started, they're trying to get organized You know, they're trying to do their thing, they need the gym gym floor is gone what are they going to do? Walk the track <laughs> that's what they're going to do think about that with Israel, walking that track 40 years. So they send the spies into the land after they're getting ready to, to make another attempt at this and they, they get sent to a contact named Rahab. And Rahab's attitude was, we believe. We believe. We remember the story of the Exodus. We believe that God brought you out of Egypt. Where have you been for 40 years? <laughs> We've been walking the track. She was ready and her family was ready. That Gentile, that Gentile woman and her family living in a city that is not known for godliness in any way, shape, or form. It's a pagan city. And, and Jericho is a type of hell in the Bible. When you go to Jericho, you know what direction you go down? Down. You go down to Jericho. And when you get there, you find yourself in a plain. And that, that, that land that Jericho sits on is the lowest point below sea level of any place on this planet. That's how far down it is. It's like a big giant plain, but it's a big hole. And Jericho's down in there. So when you go down to Jericho, they don't just mean like we're going down to the store. It's You're literally going down. And so this whole thing, it, it, as you see Israel's history, it, it's, it's incredible. I wrote up on number one up there, if you want to write those down, Acts 7, 2 and Acts 6, uh, 13, 6. You have two synopsis uh, reports of Israel's Old Testament life. It's good for you to read that because it's done in a very, those are both sermons. One's by Stephen, one's by Paul. And uh, they're both really easy, short little sermons on the history of Israel and Israel's failure. It's like an encapsulated little thing that you can read, okay? It's fantastic. And then th this rejection of Moses. You remember Moses, right? And you remember back in the day when, when Moses was trying to get involved with his family and he, he, he's kind of between a rock and a hard place because he, he's, out of, he's, he's out of Pharaoh's house, really, and, and he, now he realizes he's a Jew he also begins to understand that he's going to be the person to lead him out. His mother helped him with that. And a uh, fantastic story. And you go back to Exodus chapter 2, verse 12, you can see that he tries to intercede when these people are fighting. These, these Egyptians are, uh, this Egyptian is, is messing with these Jewish brethren of his. And what does he try to do? He tries to ingratiate himself with them, and he murders the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. Pharaoh finds out about it, and puts an APB out on the guy, and Moses flees. He goes. He leaves, and he goes to the far side of the desert. And you see the, the first rejection of the leader right there. He intercedes. They reject him. That's just two of them, okay? Then they get out of Egypt. The exodus takes place 40 years later, and then there's this long, protracted period of time where they're taken out of Egypt, and it's a big deal. 
Three million people walked out of there. That's a lot of people. How do you sustain three million people in the desert of Sinai? You can't grow anything out there. There's nothing but lizards and rocks. There's nothing. And they're crying about this stuff because they're running low on stores. They've taken all this food with them that they could carry, but now they're running out, and they're crying about it. Israel had problems. You, you remember the issue there, that refusal to enter into the land. You remember the idolatry about the golden calf and how the priest Aaron was involved. He's involved with the Exodus. He's involved with all that. And then he turns around and they make this golden calf. And they bring that religious system from Egypt and they bring it out here to Sinai. And he comes down off the mountain with the law of Moses with the law of God as Moses and Joshua they come together and they've got these tablets and they're written by the finger of God and he breaks them he throws them at them and they kill a lot of people that that thing in Exodus 32 is it's it's really strange because there are a lot of people died in that after that happened some people they just remember the golden calf because they, they don't really follow the whole story along. You don't get that in the movie with Charlton Heston. You don't get the details. But when you see how many people were swallowed up by the earth, it's pretty crazy. Did you see those people get swallowed up by that sinkhole? You see that five people? They're just standing there. All of a sudden, they're just all on the ground. We had a guy just north of us who a couple of years ago was laying in a bed, and the sinkhole opened up. And, and they never did get him out. He was gone. And this happened to a lot of people. Turn back to Exodus chapter 32 and you can see this. Israel's history is a sordid past. It's not, it's not something you, you can be proud of. It's not, a, it's not a legacy of anything that's exciting or good or wonderful. It, it's, <laughs> it's bad. This whole thing... Uh, you, you can read this story back here in Exodus chapter 32 uh, and, and this, this whole thing is laid out and, and they, they really do get in trouble and as you see them doing this they, they, they really are as a nation they're so new that they're floundering and they're, they're really a problem. This story is typical of the way Israel's life would be. All these stories back here are all typical. We talked about the game saying of Korah in Jude two weeks ago and that rebellion where the priests all got together and decided to rebel. And you remember Mo, uh, Aaron and his sister Miriam did the same thing. And they became leprous and they had leprosy all over them. Remember that? They said, uh, is Moses the only one that can do all this? And, and so they wanted to do the work of the, the high priest. And, and, and God struck them both with white leprosy. And they had to be put outside the camp. They had to stop. And they put them outside the camp. And they had to wait you know, so many days before they could be cleansed. And as that cleansing took place, they realized, you know what? Hmm, maybe, we should, maybe we should rethink this rebellion idea. Leprosy is a type of sin in the Bible, and, and, and that wasn't the place for it. And so all these things begin to happen. God is so gracious that what he does for Israel, look, look at number, five, uh, number six, the calendar of five courses of judgment. He takes in Leviticus 26, he lays out five courses, just like you would lay out a calendar of what he's going to do to them in their future. Not only could they see what was going to happen to them, but they could also kind of judge and see how long their whole program was going to be. Okay? They couldn't figure the whole thing out because there's a, there's a gap between the first and second coming, but, but they did understand that there were five courses. They could learn that. That was a real problem for them to have to go through those things. And Leviticus 26 lays them out. 
they also went into captivity. If you remember, the first 490 years of Israel's history, they were supposed to set aside their land every seven years and let it lie fallow and not farm it. And that would prepare it for another seven years of crops. But they didn't want to do that because they lost money that year. They didn't get any food off the ground. Not enough to get seven years of plenty. They wanted eight. Okay. So what do they do? They don't do it. 490 years goes by. And that was, that was to happen every seven years. So now they owe 70 land Sabbaths to the Lord. They owe it. When they went down into Babylon because of their idolatry, you know how long they stayed down there? 70 years. You know what happened to their land during that 70 years? Nobody farmed it. He got it all back in one 70-year period. Well, as a result, Daniel finds himself down there. Turn to, turn to Daniel chapter 9. Turn back to the book of Daniel. And uh, turn to chapter 9, and you'll find out how Daniel is learning about these five courses of judgment, and he now begins to understand why they're down there. He goes down there as a teenager. He, he was one of the elite, educated class of Israel. They had a, he had a good education, him and his friends. They were not uh, potato farmers, but they were uh, educated young men. And when they went down there, they were screened and they were brought forth to the king. I mean, this was a big deal. And, and Daniel is a student. He's a, he's a studier. And notice what he says in 9.2. In he says, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. He figured it out by reading the Bible. So when they went down there, what did they take with them? They took the word of God with them. And they're studying it down there, and they're reading it down there. And he figured out not only that he was why they were there, but I think he probably found out he was never going home. They eventually were let go. They were eventually allowed to go back into the land under Ezra and Nehemiah. But that did not happen. A lot of them didn't come back. A lot of them stayed out there. So Israel's past, Israel's history, and everything that goes on with that nation is all laid out for you, and that's just a, a, a kind of a selection of them that I thought you know, that would look good for uh, kind of giving us a good selection and a good choice, but I can tell you that, that this, it didn't stop there because after they came back into the land of Israel and they began to build the temple, rebuild the temple, they couldn't get anywhere with it because it was such a massive project. Uh, it wasn't like building it in Solomon's day, so they start to they're trying to repair the temple and rebuild the walls of Jerusalem under Ezra and Nehemiah, there's this long period of 400 years in which there's no contact with God from, from heaven at all. His prophets are functioning, and, and he's speaking to them that way, but there, there is really no... It's kind of a period of silence. And uh, that long period of silence is interrupted by the last portion of the fifth course. So the fifth course has five parts in it. Parts one, two, three, four are already done by this time. And the fifth part of it begins with John the Baptist. So after the 400 years is done, and, and your Bible will show you, if you go, go back to the uh, book of Matthew, And then keep going until you come to the, the, the page that it says the New Testament. Let's go past Matthew. You might have a page that explains the four Gospels and a few things. And then there's going to be a blank page. You see the blank page? It says the New Testament. You guys have one of those? You got one right there. There you go. That's a blank page. You know what that page does? It artificially divides Genesis through Malachi from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It artificially puts a divider there that God never put there. That's called wrong division right there. Because now you have, you have a, a, a thing that the 
the publishers have now decided that they're going to make this decision, that this is now, because of this 400-year period, this intertestament period, you'll hear it called, this is something that uh, we, we need to make this division so you understand. This is the New Testament. You see, the problem is, when you talk to a Jew about the Old Testament, to him it's not old, it's still the same thing. He's never, he doesn't have a New Testament. He doesn't believe Matthew through Revelation. So a Jew says, what do you mean old? What made it old? Well, the answer is the New Testament will make it old. But the New Testament has not come to fruition yet because Israel rejected their New Testament. You see, the Lord Jesus Christ was that testament. He came and he shed the blood. He ratified the testament. And then he died. And the testament would have went into effect had Israel believed who he was. But they didn't. See, the program did get stopped, didn't it? It got postponed. That's why we're here. And so this blank page here is really not true. So if you want to tear a, Bible, a page out of your Bible at any one time in your life, that's the one to tear out. Because it's useless. Okay? It, it technically isn't because I just taught a lesson for you on it. But, but it is true. It's like the red letters. It's pure opinion, okay? So just forget it. The idea now is that as this rejection of God's Son takes place, what happens? Israel gets an opportunity to believe, and they blow it. So then what? Well, they crucify their king, and then what happens? They're forgiven for that, and then they're given a year of extension, it's called, uh, customarily it's called that year of extension from Pentecost to Stephen and they have the opportunity to believe that he is their Messiah and Peter tries to give them this message and he preaches it in Acts chapter 2 he preaches it in Acts chapter 3, 4, 5, 6 and it just keeps going and they continue to reject it and then what happens they fully reject all three people involved in this project who sent John the Baptist Anybody know? It's a pretty hard subject to talk about sometimes because people, they, 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 they don't. They, they mistake John the Baptist for John the Apostle sometimes. And uh, it's kind of a strange thing. John 1 says this. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Okay? Now that's John the Baptist. He was sent from who? God. God the Father sent him. And... There wasn't anybody else to send him. Okay? Jesus Christ hadn't even been ordained into the ministry yet. John was preaching six months before Jesus Christ ever shows up. He, he, he doesn't start preaching and teaching and having ministry till he's 30 years old. John was six months older than him. He had already began. He's in the wilderness preaching. So John begins it, and then John is beheaded and killed, and then the Lord Jesus Christ takes that ministry over, and it grows and swells up, and then it continues on until they kill him. So now you've got God the Father rejected by his man John, and now you've got God the Father rejected by his son Jesus Christ, who's also representing the Savior, and, and, and as the Savior represents God, and that's who he is. And then a year later, after the crucifixion, they stone Stephen, and they reject the Holy Spirit. And so when you reject God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, you, you, that's three strikes, you're out. Now what? Well, there's a new message, and that message of Israel rejecting the forgiveness of God and the gospel is now being brought forth. Turn over to Romans chapter 10, and you can see why this happens. Now, Israel is depicted historically also in Romans 9, 10, and 11. Okay, so uh, if you want to add that to uh, Acts 7, 2, and Acts 13, 6, you can. Romans 9, 10, 11, all three chapters. Israel's past, chapter 9, Israel's present, chapter 10, and Israel's future, chapter 11. So you want to know about right division? You're going to learn about a group of people called Israel that have a past, a present, and a future. Guess what? You're not part of that. First lesson in right division. Take those three chapters and separate them apart from the rest of the book of Romans as dispensational understanding and so now you begin to understand what right division is. Now you've taken these three periods of time 
and understanding that within these three periods of time, God has three specific and different things for this nation to believe. Israel's believing had to do with something completely different in Acts chapter 9 in their past than it did in chapter 10 and that it will also in chapter 11. Israel has yet to believe who the Messiah is. They have yet to believe that Christ died for their sins. They have yet to believe that he is the promised one that they've been looking for. So what happens? They reject the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. They kill the Son. And now we come and we see why they did it. Look at chapter 10. Romans chapter... Um, I'm sorry, look at the end of chapter 9. Uh, verse 30, he says, What shall we say then? That the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness have attained to righteousness. Now they have a real problem because they had been deteriorating for this whole period and th there's, there's just a lot of problems. Uh, you know, when, when you look at this, go, go back up into verse 20, um, 26. In 9.26, notice what he says. He says, And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, Ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Isaiah also crieth concerning Israel, Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. So you see, there's a small part of them. A remnant is what's left. A remnant is not the main body, it's what's left. And so, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of Sabaoth had left us a seed, that's the seed of the woman. He says, we, what, had been as Sodom and been made like unto Gomorrah. That would have been our ending. That's where we would have ended up. Well, that's where a lot of them are going to end up. Fire and brimstone, okay? That's what Sodom and Gomorrah got. Verse 30, what shall we say then? Now, here's a good question. He says that the Gentiles which followed not after righteousness, remember, they, they weren't even under that law system. They were outcasts, given up, have attained to righteousness. How'd they do that? Even the righteousness which is of faith. Well, Rahab had it back there. She was a Gentile and she got it. Gentiles can get it if Israel would just take it to them. But they didn't want to. He says, but Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Why didn't they get it by following what? Why didn't they get it by following after the law of righteousness? Verse 32, wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. But, he says, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. You see, when you don't think you need something or you don't see it, you stumble over it. You ever see that? I don't, I don't like it when people put things out for me to stumble over. Do you? I don't care for that. That bothers me a little bit. That's why I'm kind of a stickler about things in the way, in the doorways and in the hallways and things like that. Because you walk through there sometimes if it's dark and you, you stumble, you hit it, hit your toe. You might fall and break your neck. You know, like leaving the dishwasher front down in the, in the kitchen? You know, that could be dangerous. <laughs> Whack yourself on that thing going through there. You see, when Israel stumbles over it, why is it that they stumble over the Lord Jesus Christ? The stone that the builders rejected, that they, they took the stone, they could not figure out how it went into the thing, and into the building, and so they just rolled it down the hill. They cast it aside. And later on, there it is, way down the hill. They go, that's the capstone, you idiot. That goes on the top. That's why it's in the shape of a pyramid. It goes on the top. They were looking for all the other size stones. They're trying to put this thing together. And all of a sudden, they, they don't get it. When it comes to their Savior, 
the reason they stumble at that stumbling stone, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, they stumble because they don't think they need a Savior. As it is written, verse 33, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense. But here's how you deal with a stumbling stone. He says, And whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You know, when you believe on somebody without seeing them, that's when you're blessed. That's what happened with Thomas. Because Thomas would not believe the Lord Jesus Christ for a whole week that he was resurrected. He finally believes him when he can touch him. But, but you know what the Lord says to him? Because of this, blessed are all those who believe without seeing. Do you and I see the Lord Jesus Christ when we believe on him? No. We believe the word of God. Okay? Israel's failures in the past are all based upon the fact that they had the word of God and they rejected it. Sounds like Adam and Eve, doesn't it? Sounds like Cain, doesn't it? Yeah. Sounds like all the people that went and drowned in the flood, doesn't it? Okay? It sounds like the same thing from the beginning to the end of this book. It has to do with you believing the words of God. Some people say, well, God never wrote us any words. Well, I tell you what, if you'll read enough of them, you'll realize that he did. You, you can't get past it. Now, whether you believe it or not, that's up to you. But I, I think he makes his case. Israel falls as, re, as a result of this. They reject God's forgiveness for the cross. And then they fall. They reject the gospel of the kingdom. They reject the Savior. They reject Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They fall. Israel falls and they lose their position. They lose their status. And then they are diminished away. Over about a 30 to 40 year period, they just diminish away. And so now there is no difference at all. What happens to the message? Turn over to Romans chapter 11. Their future, bright and glorious. And Paul doesn't want you to forget it. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. He's telling you about the dispensation of grace right there, and, and not to be ignorant of that. But look at verse 26. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written... There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. You see, there is absolutely no way that God cannot do what he says he's done, or says he's going to do, in prophecy without being a liar. Chapter 3, you're going to see that, that, that everybody, you know, they, they accuse God of being a liar. Uh, I read yesterday a Jew made the statement that I don't believe in Paul, I believe he's a liar. And uh, it's like, okay, well, well, good luck with that one. You know, he wrote his 13 epistles to so 65% of your New Testament. Well, he doesn't believe any of it, much less just Paul's epistles. So you can understand verse 28. Look at verse 27, 28 of Romans 11. He says, for this, cause my co uh, for this is my covenant unto them. Israel has a contract. It has to do with the Abrahamic covenant. And he says when I shall take away their sins. You know what's going to happen? He's going he's to pull them out of a big mess in the tribulation, and they're going to believe on him. Two-thirds of them are going to die and go to hell. One-third of them will believe, and they're going to get saved, and they're going to be sorry they ever were a part of that nation. But that nation will be built up again. But what about today? Look at verse 28. As concerning the gospel... As concerning what you're doing today, what are they? They are enemies, he says, for your sakes. In other words, they've become the enemies of God because God is now saving you instead. Can they get saved? Yes. But for those who harden their hearts and are uncircumcised in heart and ears, what happens? They become enemies of us. Now, we don't consider those people enemies in the sense that you know, they're shooting at us or anything like that. But the point is, does the nation of Israel agree today with Christianity? They do not. 
they're Jews, and they want to promote Judaism. This is why the whole Arab world is out to kill them, because they don't believe it. They're out to kill us, too. So any, anybody that believes in anything other than that, <laughs> that they believe, they want to kill. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, he says. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. When it comes to those who are that part of Israel that do believe, the elect of Israel, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. For the gifts, of calling, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. You see, for as in verse 30, for as ye in time past have not believed God, you Gentiles, ye have now obtained mercy through what? Their unbelief. Even so, have these also now not believed that through your mercy they may also, they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Wow. You see, we get it. They reject it. But they can still get it today through us if they believe our message. Israel isn't left without a message today. A Jew today can get saved. He, first thing he has to learn is he's not really a Jew. That there's no difference now. And so as you see it, you see the whole thing closing up. Go back to Romans chapter 2. Paul lays it on him. And he's talking really to the self-righteous religious Jews who didn't think they needed a savior. He was one of these people. Paul's review of Israel's history of unbelief continues on with Paul because what happens with Paul is what do they do? They take a vow to kill him. They chase him his entire life while he's preaching this. He suffers great for this whole message and he ends up in 2 Timothy chapter 4. He's what? He's in prison. And he's, he, everything's, everything's falling apart. Now, all in Asia have forsaken me. And they are, they are all running away. They're jumping ship. Christianity isn't dying today. It died when Paul was dying in prison. Before he ever died, it was already gone. It apostatized. That's what happened. Now, it didn't stop because God wasn't finished. And so God continued on with it. And so Timothy took up the banner and he left and he went on and did his thing. And the, Timothy's disciples did the same thing and it just kept on going and kept on going. And who would have thought it would have gone 2,000 years? Aren't you glad it went 2,000 years? You know, the Lord told some people one time, he says, it'd be better for you if you'd have just never been born rather than to, than to meet me and not believe me. It'd have been better that a millstone be put around your neck and you'd just be cast into the sea. It'd be better for you if you'd have never come into this world than to come into this world and reject me. Because now you're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. So, well, that's true. It is better to not be born than to go to the lake of fire. But isn't it also better to spend eternity with him than to never be born? Oh, yeah. I'll take the choice any time. If you say, well, if you'd have just never been conceived, Russ, would it be okay with you? Well, I wouldn't have known anything, right? That's right. But now I do have the opportunity to know some things. Now I have the opportunity to learn it all and to have it all. All because somebody gave me the gospel. The gospel, when you look at it, is so simple and easy. And yet the Jews, with all their advantages, they did not want anything to do with God's word. Paul's review of Israel's history of unbelief shows that even with all of the advantages of being God's chosen people and, separate, and a separate nation, they proved, like the Gentiles, that all men, as descendants of Adam, cannot reach God by their own righteous, self-made religions. The wrath of God is coming. Romans 5, 9 says so. And Christ alone is the only one that can save you from it. He hath delivered us from the wrath to come. You, you know where the safest place in the universe is? In Christ. So, you know, when you get down to this, you realize that it's actually not a surprise that Israel acted the way they did. 
And it's not a surprise that he made a difference between Jew and Gentile to prove that there was no difference between Jew and Gentile. He concludes all under sin. He concludes all men to be unbelievers by nature. And yet he still offers us complete and total amnesty, complete and total forgiveness, and offers us eternal life just by believing it. That's a message I can live with. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word today. We thank you for the blessings of grace, and we thank you for the wonderful opportunities that we have under grace to just believe the gospel and get saved and not worry about everything else. It makes life so much easier. Even though we deal with the troubles of life like everyone else, we don't do it in such a serious way. We don't do it in such a way that it scares us or gives us uh, takes away our peace. We can have peace if we trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that peace is brought to us by the grace of God. And we appreciate that grace and we thank you for it. We thank you for all the things that we have today. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Okay.